Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the AAE Parent Forum. Um, we are going to be presenting information about our planned reopening. I'm Valley Andresen, AAE Principal, and with me today is our CEO and President Lisa Lamb. Um, we have we have allotted 45 minutes. Um, we have other parent forums for um, one um, for our other school in San Bernardino, Norton Science and Language Academy at one o'clock. And so we have 45 minutes allowed for this particular parent forum. There's also one offered today um, for in Spanish, if you're interested in that. This uh, presentation will be recorded and will be posted on our website and probably our social media sites as well. Mm -hmm. So we're since we only have 45 minutes, we'll be going through quite a bit of information. If you miss something, um, you should be able to access the recording later and, and view that again. Um, also, um, questions and answers. We hope to have plenty of time at the end, but if you do have questions that um, we're unable to get to, feel free to contact us. Also, we are starting to, again, hold our monthly parents and pastry meetings on the second Friday. So there will be one um, next Friday where you'll again receive updates and be able to on Friday, um, February 12th. So with that, we'll get started and Lisa will take the first slide. All right, uh, thank you all for joining us. We have 138 parents on the line, over 300 registered for today's forum. We know that you are very anxiously awaiting our reopening and opening of all grade levels. So we want to take this time to share with you where we're at and what our plans are. So uh, a lot has changed since we made the decision to, to close back down at Thanksgiving time. Um, some of those most significant changes that are allowing us to, to begin reopening opening our first and foremost our regional stay at home order was lifted and that means that our local conditions have improved and that we have at least a 15 percent um, availability in local hospitals which is a really great thing miss andresen uh put a picture here this was the cnn crew over at saint mary's yesterday as they were taking down the tent we were also working the vaccine clinic with saint mary's yesterday and so there was just definitely a, a huge feel among all of us who were over there and especially the medical community that we are turning a corner on this and, and it was a, just a great sense of hope to be there. So uh, we also now in our community, we all know we were really hard hit over the holidays. There has, um, really been a reduction in cases and we believe that's due to a couple of factors one is that there's um, a temporary natural immunity because so much of our community and even our school community has been directly infected we have that natural immunity building up and also uh, vaccines have been, become available and and people are getting those over the last few weeks and so that's really helping us turn that corner Vaccines are becoming available for educators. As with any of the rollouts and in, in anything, all of these are brand new systems and all of our local uh, agencies are trying to figure it out. And it hasn't been as smooth as uh, we would have wanted, but I, I think honestly that's to be expected in an initiative so, so large as this. We are very fortunate to have been able to partner directly with St. Mary's and really even help them pilot what's going to become a huge uh, community vaccine site where we're hoping that once it gets um, fully going and the allocations are available, they'll be able to uh, vaccinate over a thousand a day. But because we've been on the front lines and we've been dedicating our staff and Apple Valley Unified together working with them and they are also staffing it, that um, many of our staff members have been able to receive their first dose of their vaccine this week. In fact, all of our elementary teachers who wanted it and all of our special education teachers and frontline workers who wanted it have been able to receive their first dose of the vaccine. So that's really big news for us. And then uh, another thing that has changed is uh, we've had to really update and revise our COVID plan. Some of the changes, um, actually makes sense. We think that, you know, there's there have been a lot of schools who have been in session during this time because their local conditions were different and there have been lessons learned. And so either, for the most part, either these changes were things that we were already doing or things that um, we think make a lot of sense. 
This is a, just a few pictures we wanted to share with you from the vaccine clinic. Um, just really thanks to all of our AVUSD and uh, Lewis and our staff who's been able to both work and receive their vaccines. Okay, um, I think Ms. Andresen wants to talk about some key dates, February 16th being one of them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, we were fortunate to have um, our SPED small cohorts back starting in September, I think, and um, and again, closed down right before Thanksgiving with, along with TK5 that we had received a waiver for. So they are able to return um, February 16th, which is the day after the President's Day holiday. Um, we're off on February 15th. Um, so those groups will, will be returning. Um, the SPED staff is reaching out to all of those families and should be receiving their information um, from them. Uh, in addition, we're because of the stay-at-home order being lifted and things improving locally, we're able to return all of our staff to campus full-time. They had been here from August until the end of November when the stay-at-home order um, went into effect and we were no longer going to have students on campus. We allowed them to work remotely or on campus, their choice. But now they're all coming back. Um, they will um, be returning on that date, February 16th. Elementary staff will be preparing for student return on February 22nd. And we have a slide with more information on that. Middle school, high school staff are preparing for high school small groups and possible hybrid. And we'll go into that more. So we had our elementary waiver and so we were considered open and all we have to do is we had to submit a plan and make a few, tweak a few things to um, fit and be in compliance with updated guidelines. But um, we're able to come back and we phased in, we know what we're doing. We're, we're not going to you know, start, okay, let's do 2K2 for two weeks and then 3-5. We're bringing TK5 back all together on Monday, February 22nd. We'll be using the same in-person bell schedule from eight o'clock until 12 o'clock. Um, the same stable groups or cohorts that we had uh, before we postponed hybrid instruction. So that what we were calling cohort A or now group A um, comes on Mondays and Tuesdays, two days a week. And cohort or now stable group B will be attending on Thursdays and Fridays. We're not starting a new survey, we're not starting um, rosters, we're assuming that the majority of those families that participated in hybrid instruction want to return again in that instructional uh, model. So we're using the same in-person class rosters that we had in November. Um, our goal is to stay open for the remainder of the year, unless we have a temporary closure um, due to an outbreak, you know, or are directed by our public health officials. Um, to do so. So um, with that, um, we'll remind you of this again, um, please contact my administrative assistant, Sherry P Pearson at extension 302. If it's going to be different than November, that means if your children were in hybrid in November and you want them to continue in full distance learning at this time, or if your child or children were in, have been in full distance learning all along this school year, and now you want your children to join us for hybrid instruction beginning February 22nd. And Valley, just a, a couple questions that have come along. Um, the option for distance learning will be provided for at least the rest of this year. Um, and so that was a question. Will we still have an option to do distance? Yes. Yes, you will. Thank you for um, monitoring the chat and sharing that. And I put Sherry's email address also in the chat, and I believe that it will be visible to everybody. Perfect. Okay. This one's this one's me, Valley. Yes, please. Okay. All right. So th there have been some changes. So we did want to share, give you a brief overview of what we see would be applicable to you regarding the new guidance for schools. And again, this you can see by the kind of snapshot of the front of it, this was updated January 14th. So it's fairly recent. So as far as face coverings, we have updated our policy for staff. Staff will be wearing these uh, multi-layer disposable blue uh, masks. We have found that those are the safest and we know that adults are, are most at risk of, of spread. And so we, our goal is to keep our 
staff as, as safe as possible. The only time that they won't be wearing one of these is if they are doing something where their articulation is particularly important and then they'll have the clear face shield with a drape. And we've provided all of those. For students, they can either wear one like this and they do make child size, or they can wear a at least multi-layer cloth, nicely fitting mask. So it cannot be a single layer, so it can't be a bandana or one of those um, you know, gaiters that you pull up. It needs to have at least two layers and be uh, well fitted. Student testing recommendations. When the governor came out the last Friday in December, there was he announced that there was going to start to be mandated staff and student testing for asymptomatic surveillance testing every week. Because we had already submitted our waiver and we were already open, we do not fall under this, this guidance. So we will be continuing asymptomatic testing for staff every two months. And we are not intending to do asymptomatic testing for students. Now that's always available to you as families. We have great resources in our communities, or in our community from VVC to Walgreens or CVS for you to get that if you want to do that uh, screening for your children, but we will not be mandating it. Something that we are adding though, that we think that will be really helpful for you. Uh, we are working with Valencia Labs to do have test kits here available on site so that we can do symptomatic testing for our staff or for our students if you request it. So if something happens and um, during the day they're here and they start to develop symptoms and our nurse calls you and you talk with Dr. Obeer and you want her to get to do a test for you, we'll have that option just to make it nice and convenient for you. Um, we really ask if your children are participating in hybrid instruction that you do symptom and exposure screening at home every day before leaving for school. One of the best ways that we can be open and stay open is to make sure that no one's coming to school sick. And so we'll send out again what those questions are, what those symptoms are, and we just ask that you make sure to, we're just asking you to make sure to do that each and every day. If we notice any symptoms or we have any concern, of course, we can do in-person wellness checks here at school. Uh, we will continue to notify you of positive cases or confirm close contacts that happen here at school or if there's any in the classroom. So you would receive direct notification from us about those. And then another new thing that's actually really good for us is some of the quarantining guidelines have been adjusted down. So it was, for instance, 14 days and now it has been reduced to 10. Also, if a, a student or a staff member were to have been positive within the last 90 days and they have another close contact, they do not need to quarantine. That's really big for us. And then also the travel um, advisory for quarantines, it's, it's um, a guideline, not a mandate, so that wouldn't be something that we had to account for. So these are just, these are some uh, just adjustments or tweaks or improvements that we think are, are going to be helpful for us. There's also, I've heard from a lot of you that there's concern, you've heard that kids are gonna be vaccinated or they're gonna be required or mandated. Please know we have no indication of that whatsoever. So we are very big believers in um, providing agency as much as possible. And so we see um, no vaccines in the near future, at least for, for children, or there's no indication that we would ever have to mandate that. Everything, things could change over the years, but just rest at ease that that's not a requirement. And the other thing that I, I've heard from several parents, and I know Ms. Andreessen has as well, is, you know, your charter school, why don't you just open and why can't you just, you know, come back in person five days a week? Um, we are a public charter school and we do very much have to report to our, our authorizing district, to our county um, superintendent, as well as our county department of public health, to the California Department of Education, to the California Department of Health, and follow CDC guidelines. So we are not exempted from any of these guidelines whatsoever. And so I just, I, I, I think that um, sometimes there's a, a feeling that we have more flexibility than we have. Oh, sorry, Valley. Okay, let's talk about middle school and high school. And before we do that, in reference to the last slide, um, we wanted to remind you that there are medical conditions that exempt mm. 
Thank you. Students and staff from wearing a face covering. So if if that is your your um, the situation with your family, you need to reach out to our um, registered school nurse, Heather O'Beer, and work through that process with her. Also, if you have any health concerns, um, please mm -hmm. go through her in the health office. Okay, before returning. A couple of things too that have been asked that I think we could answer right now is when can we go to five days a week? Uh, the biggest thing that would keep us from doing that is the social distancing. So we would have to have the social distancing requirement lifted. One change that was in here was they defined a minimum. So before it was six feet as practicable. Now it is six feet and four feet of a minimum. So we always have to keep students no matter what. We have to shoot for the six feet or more but we can never break the four feet. So we just don't have the capability to keep students that distanced and have all of them back. So we'll have to wait until those, those restrictions are lifted. Hopefully as the vaccine becomes more widely available and other things change, we'll see some of that. Thank you for explaining that. Yes, so in an elementary classroom with 25 or 28, you know, we could only fit half that at most. Um, that number of students in a classroom and that's why we're using a hybrid model at this time we also looked at being able to do full day you know with our hybrid instead mm -hmm. of well and again what's pre one of the reasons there's m multiple factors that we're unable to do that at this time and are continuing in a four-hour hybrid model is because of lunches so we're on eight we can't have our students eating in the classroom our teachers need break we're not able to supervise all of them during that lunch period um, and so um, we're, we're really excited that our NPR is progressing and we'll be ready mm -hmm. in May. Um, that is um, something else where we will be able to have um, two outside or three dining areas, the new multi-purpose room, the outside dining um, area outside the gym, and also inside the gym in our famous gym materia um, that we set up. Um, and so that will give us that capacity. So our goal is to bring our students back for as many hours, eventually full days, five days a week. So it, but again, social distancing, guide, distancing guidelines, et cetera, are preventing us at this time from doing that. So um, middle school and high school, gosh, you've really been left out. We cannot believe that it has been almost an entire year since we've been able to have you on our campuses. And we know it's long overdue. But under California's blueprint for a safer economy, our middle and high school students cannot return until our county is in the substantial or red tier for at least two weeks. So we, we're, we're hearing optimistic projections of our county reaching that point. Um, hopefully that would be wonderful. We want if that could happen the next month. But you know, once that happens again, we have to have two weeks before we open. So knowing that there's no sense opening, even if that does occur, you know, a week or two before spring break, right? And so a good um, start date for that, if we are eligible and in that red tier would be um, April 5th after spring break. So we're gonna be watching that closely and uh, planning accordingly. Um, so our goal is to offer hybrid instruction to all middle school and high school students. If we're not out of the red tier and we remain in the purple tier, um, we are allowed and it's poss uh, uh, possible we are going to implement small co cohorts for vulnerable students. So um, that's something that we will select based on data data, um, such as if students um, have multiple failing grades and are not progressing towards graduation, um, if they're not participating in um, full distance learning and their attendance is extremely poor, um, we are going to act, ask them and direct them um, to return in hybrid cohorts. So that's where we are with middle school, high school. Okay, next big one. This one. So Lisa and I were even discussing this before our meeting. So where are we at on this? And I should have our athletic director, director Umberto um, Ramos on here. It's confusing. Guidelines seem to con conflict, right? So it's been that physical conditioning practice, skill building and training um, that can be conducted outdoors with six feet of physical distance and within stable cohorts are authorized, regardless of your county tier. And that's what Lisa was, was hearing and stuff. Um, but um, 
again, during the stay at home order, most places were closed even, um, and most um, recreational and school sports were not taking place um, during the stay at home order or in counties with purple tiers. If you go to the next slide, but in addition to that, we are also following our CIF guidelines and CIF has linked specific sports to the tiers. Um, so there are very few sports. Um, the only one that we offer that was um, could have possibly been done um, was um, cross country in the purple tier. So um, what we have and everyone, are, all our leagues, everyone else was, um, um, and with the local conditionings, we're not even having physical conditioning and practice of skills during during the last several months. So we are now at a point where we can consider um, participating in winter sports season, which begins in March. Um, the four sports that AAE offers that fall into CIF Southern Section's um, winter sports season are uh, baseball, softball, track and field, and tennis. And so we're looking at starting those teams back up and you will hear more information from Umberto Ramos, athletic director. If you're interested in those, please jump on any direction he gives you. Like I know we um, did an interest survey um, in athletics earlier for our student athletes and encourage them to go ahead and get a sports physical if they might be interested in participating. And we've got very, very few that, that did that. And so now there's a, a lot more confidence and hope that this is gonna happen. And so um, please look at those um, requirements except for sports, physicals, et cetera, and hopefully we'll get those off the ground. Okay. All right, so I can um, cover this slide. So what do I do now? So we've given you this information. You're probably, I don't know if your head's spinning and, and um, just wanted to go over a few things again. So if your TK5 ch child will be in the same instructional model as they were in November, either hybrid or full distance learning, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to contact us at all. They're gonna go right back to, um, you know, that same hybrid in-person, class list or continue in full distance learning. But if you do have changes, um, please contact Sherry Pearson at extension 302. Uh, Lisa had put in the chat also her email address, which is spearson at lcer.org with any changes. And we need those by Friday, February 19th. Again, we wanna get these stable groups set and not be making changes once we get after we get started. And everyone has had a chance um, over you know, um, the month that we were in hybrid to kind of become familiar or gain some knowledge about what that looks like. So hopefully you're able to make those decisions now before we start and there will not be a grace period for changing. You always have the option though to go back into full distance learning. So if something happens in your family, you know, that 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 is possible, but we will not be adding anyone to the hybrid um, classes probably now for the rest of the school year. Um, um, so for elementary. So we encourage you to watch for more information. Um, we post updates on our school website, aae.lewiscenter.org. Please go there. That's where um, everything is officially posted. Um, there also are things on social media, um, such as our official uh, Facebook page. Um, watch for those weekly infinite campus parent messages. We know that some with AOL or Yahoo E, um, email carriers have get those blocked. They go, uh, go emails from this, the school go directly into your spam or junk um, um, inbox. So please um, watch for those messages. By the way, um, we have petitioned our IT department five separate occasions to have Yahoo um, change that and unblock our 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 school from their from their the people that use those accounts. But that has not happened and we now have a workaround. We're making a change in the next month and going forward that hopefully that will not be an issue. Um, also, um, I mentioned we're gonna start holding our monthly parents and pastry meetings again. And the first one falls next Friday, February 12th. And so you'll have an opportunity then to ask any questions and gain more information then. And we hope to record that one as well and post that for those of you that are unable to view it in real time. Okay. 
All right, questions and answers. I think so. So one of the questions, Valley, is if I if I don't choose to go hybrid now, when's the next time that I would have an opportunity to do that? Our plan through um, since the beginning of the year was that um, parents would have a choice in their um, choosing the instructional model for their child at um, a um, grading period, end of a grading period, or when we started a new phase. So we consider this for elementary starting a new phase now, and it's also the end of the second trimester. Mm -hmm. um, so for elementary, this will probably be the last chance um, to change, unless we have, a, again, a, a, some other change to our hybrid format, right? Um, that's different, like say we could go full day, and you're, right now you're unable to bring your child or children or pick them up at noon because you work, and so a half day, four days, hybrid schedule is not working for you um then you, you know we would allow a change but for elementary for tk5 this is probably um most likely the last opportunity you will have an uh, option to select hybrid because again we're going to try to stay open in this format for the remainder of the year okay the next question i think either of us could answer is the plan to be back to five full days in august or is it hybrid going to be the new model for 21 22 and i think the short answer is we don't know yet. Again, we would need those social distancing uh, restrictions to be lifted. We would really hope that we could be back to a five-day schedule um, or more um, than what we have are able to offer this year, but we still don't know. And let me go back to my answer about um, selecting a um, instructional model. Um, of course, middle school, high school, you haven't had that opportunity at mm -hmm. yet. And so um, for those parents, we will be, um, you know, sending out a survey when we're um, more confident that that's going to be an option. So in the coming month, you can watch for that and make your choice at that time. Good one. Okay, the next question is, will students still have, oops, Oh, I guess I could go to us. <laughs> now I only see us. No, I'll go back. <laughs> will the students still have temperature checks when they arrive on campus? Um, probably no. So again, we're um, using the new guideline that we've shared with you. I was going to pull up the front of it again, but, um, you know, they are not recommending. They're finding that it's not effective, you know, um, in pre preventing the spread of, of COVID to do those um, screening at schools and so what they ask is that um, again that we remind and educate our parents about the importance of those at home screenings in the morning before you send your child to school so all we will be doing is a physical you know screening just to look at your child and see if they appear well um, but it is not likely that we will continue to um, screen every child's temperature when they arrive. We are doing that at our kiosk for visitors, but that will not be the case at drop-off um, for our, our students. But the good thing is we do have touchless thermometers in every single classroom and in the office, so if there's a need, we can do those wellness, uh, in-person wellness checks easy. Right, so continue, teachers continue to have those, and mm -hmm. um, if a child reports that they're not feeling well, uh, before they send them to the health office, they do take their temperature. And so um, we will do be doing it at those times. Uh, the next question is a really good one and I'm glad it's asked. During the last opening, we did not see notifications for exposures unless we missed the email. Moving forward, how will the exposure notification work and what qualifies as an exposure and what does not? I'll take that one. So a defined close contact exposure is being within six feet for a cumulative of 15 minutes within a 24 hour period. So you will be contacted directly if uh, in the contact tracing process, which is conducted by our uh, registered nurse, Dr. Obier, and in coordination with our human resources director, they go through the contact tracing. And so if it is found that your child was a defined close contact, you will get a direct phone call regarding that. If there are positive cases within the classroom, you will get an email. Yes, so if, you know, it doesn't make sense if um, my office or I'm COVID positive and I don't have any contact with students, they're not gonna notify the entire school, right? Um, or but yes if your child is in a classroom or has a close contact you will be notified 
This question I don't know the answer to. Um, do you know if any plan for the town of Apple Valley doing ASAP for working parents? So not on our campus, I don't believe. Valley, have you heard anything about ASAP? Um, yes. So I don't think they are looking to to start that again this year. Like start a, a program at noon when we dismiss and have it run all afternoon. Again, um, a lot of the issues are social distancing. They're not able to, you know, um, do that without multiple locations and classrooms and and staff and so i i have heard no plans for this school year for them to start back up um, and just a plea for us to not make vaccines mandatory um we hear you we will not um dr obeer her email i think that i put it publicly so everybody can see it in the q a uh but it's h o b i e r at l c e r dot org so our, our emails are always the first letter of our first name, last name, at lcer.org. Um, I think this one we've answered. Why are there separate guidelines for middle school and high school students? Um, this, the, it, for K-12, they were the same, except for they made available a waiver for TK through sixth grade. Um, and the reasoning for that was they, at the time it was multiple, I don't know if it's even explained, my understanding is that they felt that those students were less likely to have a severe, you know, um, reaction in COVID or side effects or symptoms. Um, so they were safe. They also thought they were maybe less transmissible to adults. And I think that's, you know, Anyway, and I and the other thing was um, they also recognized that those students, the younger students, um, their education was even um, more strongly impacted um, by full distance learning. They were less likely to be successful, and so they felt that those they should be prioritized to come back to school. And so we did apply for that waiver, um, and. Um, and are, we're considered open. And again, that's why we can open now without following some of the new things that might come out about, oh, you have to test students weekly or whatever. But um, middle school, high school remains again under that um, blueprint for reopening um, where it states that you have to be in the red tier if you haven't been open. Yeah. Will breakfast and lunch be served like before? Definitely, most definitely, yes. Can a face shield be used as a second layer for a mask? Absolutely. So you, the mask is required for students at all times, even while playing outside or even while practicing or, or those types of things, we have to wear them at all times now. But you can always take extra precautions. So the mask and a face shield, two masks, whatever makes you feel comfortable. That's it just, there has to be a mask as a minimum. Um, Oh, this is a good question too. At what point will you no longer consider let will you no longer consider letting miss, middle school and high school return? If we get to the two weeks to the end of the April or May, would you still consider their return? We haven't set drawn a line in the sand, you know, or discuss that. We're right now optimistically looking forward to opening them, and so um, it would have to weigh the benefits of bringing them back for. It depends on how many weeks, right? Because you're going to have to teach them all of these protocols and there's some concern that some learning would be lost spending time you know um, bringing them back for just a few weeks so um good question we will keep you informed yeah we want them back in person so if it's at all practicable and feasible we're going to get them back uh another question summer school or smaller breaks would we consider those um at this time you know we're looking at the option of summer um schools offering that for mitigating learning loss um and smaller breaks um i'm we are going to continue our school calendars there's not um we're, we're not seeing a reason some people have like compacted um the school year or um we're not planning to, to eliminate them or have smaller breaks right um, as far as also, I just wanted to share, so there's also, we're, we're looking at other enrichment opportunities. So we're doing the uh, Mars um, challenge right now where students were able to sign up and we're, we're continuing to try to find more enrichment opportunities 
as well. And so. when I was thinking of athletics and activities, I really didn't mention activities. You know, we're hoping again to, you know, it all depends on what guidelines are for like outside gatherings and like what size and, you know, what um, other things are required. And so, you know, as soon as we get that multi-purpose room up, you know, we would love to start having small, you know, gatherings, whatever's allowed um, for different events and activities mm -hmm. on campus. And that indoor outdoor stage is going to be a huge benefit to us too, because we think we'll be able to do outdoor things before we'll be able to do indoor things. Right. Um, great question about our calendar changing to match ABUSD. So we do have, hopefully you received information on Monday at 4 p.m. We have our regular, regularly scheduled board meeting. We're going to be doing a presentation to align our school calendars, so our two schools to align our calendars and moving forward into the 22-23 school year. Is that correct, Valley? 22-23. Correct. Correct. So not for next school year, but the following. And so we like to have our calendars two years out. So we're going to be presenting the data, uh, attendance trends over the years prior to 2019 and before, um, and uh, looking at streamlining that, that, there's a number of benefits. Number one is we have a lot of instructional loss when our calendar is different than our local district's calendars. And so we'll be sharing that information with our board. Another great benefit will be the ability, hopefully, to streamline classes between our two high schools. Never been an option before because AAE has been our only high school. However, we are expanding in San Bernardino and are adding a high school. That high school will have a world language program that will be very robust and will definitely have offerings that we wouldn't be able to have here at AAE. And by streamlining our calendars we would be able to offer benefit to both both of our student bodies if we're able to streamline our classes so that's another a, another instructional benefit that we see so we will be presenting that monday at four and hopefully again you did receive that information and the board will be not voting on it this week they're just going to be um hearing what our proposal is and then they will be voting on it in march also march 8th Real quick, the, that um, draft calendar or proposal that we're presenting is available in the board packet, which you can find on our website on page three, I think is the, the calendar. And the main difference is instead of having two weeks of fall break, we still have one week of fall break, but then we're taking the other five days from the second week of fall break and um, making getting off like the whole week of um, Thanksgiving week. Yeah, which so is a that's, big, that's the main, big big main difference. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me okay. to so what um, kindergarten, so kindergarten we know is coming back, right? Um, with TK5 on the 22nd, um, pick up and drop off will be the same and we will be sending out videos and information. Um, for those of you that participated in it or forgot, we all need a reminder, you know, what was it? We only did it for a month for TK2 and two weeks for grades three through five. So it certainly isn't um, something become a routine or natural. So we'll remind you about all of those procedures. Um, parents, we don't know when they'll be able to volunteer. Um, they are not allowed at this time because of the cohorting guidance that we have. We have to keep our cohorts to 14 to 16, including adults. And so it's un we're, we are not introducing visitors or volunteers into those stable groups. Uniforms are still required at this time. Um, Okay. Why can't parents be notified if there has been COVID at the school? You will you will hear about it if there's a positive case. And we will contact you directly with a phone call if your child has been in close contact. So again, unable to volunteer this school year um, under current cohorting and stable group um, guidelines that we have from the California Department of Public Health. Afternoon pickups be handled. Sorry if you missed it. Um, again, we'll get that out to you. Um, we are bringing all of the um, TK5 students out to side um, for dismissal. Um, they'll be ready to go at noon. Inside the gate will be TK through two, um, socially distanced with their classroom teacher. And on the grass, we're painting spots because it's difficult for those um, children on the grass to 
to determine and keep six feet distance. And, and so we're tired of saying, use your elephant trunk, you know? <laughs> and so um, we'll tr keep them spaced. And um, again, you will pull up with your signs in your car on your dashboard, please. Um, we can recreate those if they've disappeared since November. Or you can do it by just putting your child's first and last name teacher's name and grade please on there and we'll call by radio to the teachers who will send the child to your vehicle and we'll have um, staff members all hands on deck out there um, helping put children in cars. We're also going to have our kinder aides for the first couple of weeks probably work a little longer so that they can escort the littlest ones out to their vehicle and help with that process. Okay. High school. High school. Yes. Um, is it, I got to click on that to see what the rest of it um, is. If you, yes, you wouldn't have to come back if you, if your student was struggling, but you had high risk in your home, we wouldn't require you to come back in person, but we definitely want to find a way to support so that your child's successful. Um, vaccines, really, we have no indication that there's there's a push to have vaccines for children mandated. There's there's just no indication of that. If it some years down the road became um, a thing, we would have to comply with state law, but we really don't see that coming down the pipe. Not at this time, yeah. It'd have to be legislated just like other immunizations are currently legislated for school children. And there would be huge pushback uh, politically. Um, plans for graduation. Graduation. Oh my gosh, I should share my screen. So right now we are, I just got a um, design for our uh, yard no, no. sign for our seniors. Oh, let me, let me make you a presenter, Kelly. Oh, I know darn. we don't have, no, we don't, have the, I don't know if we can find it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to do not yet here for show my screen. Um, okay. So um, I don't think I have it open. And so if I have to go hunting for it, it might not be pretty. So I just got a, no, oh, don't see it right away. I just um, received a design for senior yard signs. Boy, those are good looking. And so um, surprise, surprise, um, there's going to be delivery. As soon as those get printed, we'll have a yard sign for your senior. Um, that will be delivered to your home, a nice 18 inch by 24 inch on plastic, corrugate, pla corrugated plastic, and to put in your yard to proudly display. Um, as far as the graduation ceremony, again, it, uh, it all depends on what tier we're in and what guidelines there are for gatherings. Our optimistic plan right now, I, I'd be surprised, but it, we could get down to like the yellow tier or something and be able to do our regular inside graduation at High Desert Church but I don't know how likely that is. Um, so another option we're looking at is renting Apple Valley High School Stadium and being able to socially distance in the stadium outside with households um, being able to sit together. And again, you know, our very, very last resort would be to have another virtual graduation, but that is not our plan at this time. Mm -hmm. um, yes, all adults will be screening, doing temperature screenings daily. That was a question. Right. Uh, the, the food, evaluating the food vendor. Yes, we, we will continue to, to do so. Right. We have about two more minutes, Mrs. Lamb. It's 1243 and I know we have to prepare for Norton's um, parent forum. Are there any others on here that we can- the calendar, ask? yeah, just the calendar is being heard this Monday, being presented and will be voted on in March. And BAN, when will BAN meet? Mr. Sockwell, I know, is working on it just as soon as we get these new uh, restrictions lifted. So we'll yes. do it. I know he'll want to as soon as possible. Yeah, they have all kinds of extra restrictions for bands and choirs and that are super they, have, they have to meet. But yes, yeah. we want to get those kids together performing when mm -hmm. and practicing and performing whenever possible. OK. All right. So more information will come. We'll evaluate all the questions, anything we missed, and we'll make sure to get that information out to you. Right? Thank you all. Have a good rest of the day. Thank we you all. More. Goodbye. <clears throat> Lisa, were you able to stop broadcast? It's still on recording.